suppose what I want to start with is because people seem to be very confused about biology at the moment. It seems like everyone's having to go back to school, really, to deal with the current climate and culture and legislation and trends. So I suppose the easy one to start with is how are we defining male and female? What scientific objective characteristics can we point to to distinguish between a man and a woman? And I can't believe I'm having to ask that question in 2022. Yeah, it, it is bizarre that this is something we have to go back to the, the you know, Bio 101 textbooks. Um, so, I mean, in essence, when we're talking about what makes a male and a female, this this sort of goes back to, well, if we take one step back and, and look at sort of the concept of what a male and female is, it comes back to what type of, of gamete or sex cell that a male or a female produces. So males are defined as the the organisms that are producing small gametes, so sperm, and then females are defined as the organisms that uh, in a sexually reproducing population are producing the large gametes, eggs. So males and females are entirely defined on the, you know, the size of the gametes they produce relative to one another. Um, now, a lot of activists will then say, like, well, you know, some people don't produce sperm or eggs. Are they just sexless or something? So when we actually go down to sexing a flesh and blood individual, it's not whether they can at any given moment produce eggs or, or sperm, but if they have sort of, uh, you know, the reproductive anatomy is organized around the production of that. You know, maybe they got injured and they can't do it. Maybe for whatever reason they're sterile. But it's basically just sort of like a, a, a an organizational plan for, for the production of, of eggs and sperm. So you can usually kind of come down to whether or not you have testes or ovaries. For instance, this is largely how it's it's defined. Um, so yeah, that's that's sort of the bio 101. It's the the organizational um, how your reproductive reproductive anatomy is organized around for the production of either sperm or ova. So you obviously are in the camp that sex is binary. Uh, so I like to refer to that as the camp of reality, obviously. But um, people will often obviously throw in the idea of intersex people and how that. Um, contradicts the idea of sex as a binary. I mean, how does that fit in to your reasoning and um, how prevalent, uh, prevalent are people who are, are intersex or you know, difference in sex uh, characteristics, I think it's sometimes referred to as? Yeah, people will throw in intersex people as sort of this an example of individuals who sort of bridge this gap between males and females and therefore because they exist, sex is a spectrum, you know, males and females should therefore be thought about as sort of um, these, uh, you know, degrees of maleness and femaleness, because if there's something sort of intermediate, then that means there's there's a gradient. Um, I think what a lot of confusion comes from is they're misinterpreting a statement like sex is binary for the statement, every single individual who has ever existed and will ever exist can unambiguously be classified as either male or female. So that's not really what I mean by this. I think it's maybe theoretically possible that there could be an individual who's born who just really has these developmental conditions that have resulted in like a truly ambiguous sexual phenotype where we're like, we, you know, this is really difficult to classify this individual one or the other. That doesn't really undermine the sex binary because when I say sex is binary, what I mean is there are only two sexes, you know, an intersex individual isn't a third sex in the same way that a male or a female is because again males and females are defined sort of by the type of gamete that their their reproductive systems are organized around to produce um you know we could take a, a different species that um maybe has hermaphrodites like some snails where individuals or some frogs too individuals truly do produce and have the reproductive anatomy for both producing eggs or sperm um, you know, they're still not an example of a third sex. They're an example of an individual who's both male and female. They're composed of both sexes in one individual. So that's really just what I mean when I say sex is binary. There's only two. There's two components to biological sex. Um, whether an individual can be sort of undefined and sexless, I, I don't think there's a really clear example of that happening, but I think it might theoretically be possible. And then any sort of indication that some individuals might be able to produce both. Again, there's no real clear examples in the literature of, of individuals who've been able to produce both a sperm or ova or have had the reproductive organizational plan and, and set in place to do that. But even if 
an example could be brought up of this person producing both eggs and sperm, you know, they still wouldn't be a third sex. There's an example of someone who's exhibiting both sexes in one person. Um, so that's what we mean by sex is binary. There's only two. Intersex is a sort of this umbrella term we use um, for sort of general sex ambiguity at first glance. You know, just uh, a doctor looks at this ambiguous genitalia, they're considered to have an intersex condition. Um, it's not meant to be considered a, a third sex in any, in any meaningful way. Yeah, and I think it's a shame, really, because we often see this this thrown around in the um, in the service of trans ideology, and a lot of intersex people are kind of of the opinion of just keep me out of this. I'm nothing yeah. to do with this. It's obviously often exploited exploited as some sort of um, gambit in this row. But I often see think pieces thrown around. Uh, of people claiming that intersex people are just as common as, say, meeting people with red hair and things like that. But I believe you've done a fair bit of work debunking those statistics, haven't you? Yeah, that that claim specifically that intersex is around 1.7 or 2 percent, just as common as red hair. You know, this is based on basically um, what's it, uh, Anne Fosto Sterling. She had this article with uh, someone; their last name is Blacklist. And they basically, the, the, their definition was literally defining male and female based on, they even said like platonic ideals of male and female. They had like a range of, you know, how long the penis can be, how long the clitoris can be before they have intersex conditions. Um, but what that does is really is you can have a, a male with a micro penis who's still 100% male, you know, they just have a tiny penis. And by their definition, this would be an intersex condition and someone who's like maybe not entirely male. So that's that's not the case. I mean, you know, I feel bad for people who have this condition, but they're still 100% male. You know, your penis length doesn't define how male you are in any meaningful way. Um, so when we actually go to like a clinical, and also our, uh, the definition also includes people like uh, who have Klinefelter syndrome, who they're like XXY chromosomes. Now these people might have some like breast development that takes place but they're still 100% male. They still have testes and a penis, and they can father children, and they're fertile as, as males. Um, they might exhibit some secondary sex characteristics like breast development that are more typical for females, but still 100% male. Um, so it's really lacking a clinical relevance when you just expand the definition of what intersex is to like any variation of sexual development that deviates from the platonic ideal. Like That is such a broad category um and it and it includes individuals who are just unambiguously male or female now when you actually use a definition that is more like you know the appearance of sexual ambiguity this the, the prevalence is about 0.018 percent about one in, in five thousand um that are people who are, have like a true intersex condition so that's something i try to debunk because they try to inflate the numbers of intersex to make it seem like the boundaries between males and females are much more blurry than it really is. Yeah, and it's especially useless as an example, given it does not map on to transgenderism anyway. Yeah, yeah. Not, you know, exactly. Yeah. Overwhelmingly. That's just a, such a good point, too, is they'll say that, you know, why can't transgender women play in female sports? We'll say, well, because they're biologically male. They'll say... Well, but sex is a spectrum. Intersex people exist. It's like, okay, well, they're not intersex. These are just unambiguous males who are trying to compete <laughs> in females. So, like, th their arguments aren't even for the purpose of... They, they don't even get them where they, they hope they go. So, it's, it's really frustrating <laughs> having to deal with these.